explore the biggest questions of our time and get to know the people behind the science. This is Curiosity Meets Discovery, research talks from inside the Max Planck Society. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Curiosity Meets Discovery. I'm David Fitzpatrick, CEO and Scientific Director of the Max Planck Florida Institute for Neuroscience in Jupiter, Florida. Today, we are exploring a subject that affects each and every one of us, aging. It's well documented that our bodies change as we get older, but what are the physiological processes that drive these changes? Are there factors that we can control that impact how fast we age? Well, did you ever imagine that you might be able to get some answers to these questions from an African turquoise killifish? In fact, today's guest has discovered that studying the immune system and the gut microbiome of this naturally short-lived fish is a great way to get novel insights into the fundamental biological changes that occur with aging. With us today is Dr. Dario Ricardo Valenzano, a research group leader at the Max Planck Institute for Biology of Aging in Cologne, Germany. Thanks for sharing your science with us today, Dario, and I look forward to our discussion of this fascinating topic. Okay, thank you so much for, for the introduction. It's really uh, exciting to be here uh, to share our recent work with, uh, uh, with you, uh, and I look forward to the discussion afterwards. So um, the main focus of uh, our uh, research is understanding the basic, uh, the basic mechanisms underlying biology of aging. Uh, so throughout the lifetime, organisms undergo uh, several transformations and uh, have to face uh, and overcome a set of uh, damages and uh, uh, that did occur throughout uh, at, at different scales of biological complexity uh, from the DNA level to more complex protein level to the tissue level so there are damages at all of these uh, levels uh, damages coming from pathogens parasites as well as from 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 internal sources like transformations. So the way in which organisms deal with this damage and are able to cope with them and to repair this damage, it's key to defining ways in which organisms are able to sustain and maintain themselves from different amount of times, therefore resulting in organisms being extremely long-lived or extremely short-lived. So uh, just as a, as a reference, uh, there are organisms that we know of, like the, you know, the Greenland shark that can live several centuries. Uh, and there are organisms like the ones that we'll be discussing uh, today more in detail, like the turquoise killifish that just live a few months. So how is that that different organisms evolve to be short-lived or longer-lived is one of the main questions that my lab tries to tackle. And so we like to think about this question uh, in an evolutionary framework. So we want to understand the genomic and evolutionary basis mechanism, as well as the mechanistic basis underlying long or short lifespan and different aging rates across organisms. So um, I briefly mentioned already that the main focus, the main model systems, model system that we employ in my group is the naturally short-lived turquoise killifish. So this is an organism, is a vertebrate like, like us, that uh, um, survives just a few months, both in captivity and in nature. And what makes it extremely interesting to us is the fact that in this short amount of time, it recapitulates several features that are typical of even human aging. And I will be uh, showing and sharing some of them with you today. So here, for example, you can already see that um, in a few months of life, you see this is on the bottom, you see the age of these organisms. Uh, this is 
four, week, four months old individuals, I can already observe because I have a trained eye that males here have like a cataract in the eye. They, have, they are losing pat patterning in the tail pigmentation. And females show like a hunched back. And I will now list a few um, uh, quite uh, remarkable transformations that also at the molecular level, these organisms spontaneously undergo in this short amount of time. So the overall question that we try to answer is, what are the evolutionary and mechanistic bases underlying rapid aging in turquoise killifish? And can we use this understanding of this biology to understand more about the biology of organisms like humans? So um, one of the most interesting aspects of uh, describing aging, sporadic aging, spontaneous aging in uh, the turquoise killifish was discovering that they already in a few months of, of life undergo dramatic transformation that consists in the accumulation of markers for neurodegenerations, like it's indicated here by accumulation of A-beta-42, tau phosphorylation in the optic tectomy of the brain. And this is work done in collaboration with Anja Schneider at the ZNE e in Bonn, in Germany. In other words, in a few months of life, killifish display hallmarks of human neurodegeneration, which is not common among other organisms. Recently, in 2019, there was a paper published by another group showing that killifish undergo neurodegeneration, in particular dopaminergic and noradrenergic neurons degenerate in the killifish brain. So uh, we asked, and we are interested generally in describing several features associated with the killifish uh, aging. So I will move across different tissues for the next few slides. Here, this is work done together with Bjorn Busse. We were exploring bone aging in killifish. And uh, what Bjorn Busse's group in Hamburg uh, was able to find is that as killifish become old from just adult, these are CAT scans of killifish, uh, by the way. And so what, what they observed is that the bone density dramatically decreases. And this is not just uh, assessed by eyeballing, but is actually is quantified. Uh, and uh, bone density loss with age is actually associated with a higher risk of fracture that you can indeed um, impose on the killifish upon, um, upon stress, upon pressure. Here also you can observe like a very severe spine curvature. This is not a skeletal phenotype, this is a muscle phenotype due to uh, sarcopenia actually. So this is age, spontaneous age dependent loss of muscle mass that also occurs in killifish. Work done by a fantastic former postdoc in the lab, uh, Gaurav Ahuja, that was published in 2019. Uh, now Gaurav has its own group in Delhi, in India, showed that actually killifish also undergoes, um, you know, displays markers of aging in the heart. Gaurav was in particular looking at uh, markers of lipofuscin accumulation. This is an autofluorescent pigment. Uh, that accumulates in lysosomes spontaneously with age. And from young, middle aged to aged individuals, there was a striking accumulation of this lipid staining. And here in the bottom, you can actually see a typical marker of uh, cellular senescence, which is called senescent associated beta galactositis. So, what this slide is showing is that increased blue staining indicates an increased and an accumulation of senescent cells. Senescent cells are cells that normally replicate and that stop replicating as a consequence of the aging process. So this is dysfunctional arrest of the cell cycle, which is indicated by this pigment. In other words, killifish do undergo throughout different tissues, uh, these dramatic changes that have nothing to do with actual development because this is post adulthood, right? So it's from adult to old. We're comparing here adult individual or young adult individual to aged individuals. And here, work done by a current PhD student in the lab, Jens Zeidel, shows that in uh, uh, sections of the killifish intestine, from young adult to age, there is a striking accumulation of this pink pigment, which based on this particular type of histological staining, indicates actually accumulation of collagen. Uh, so these are actually fibrotic scars that accumulate in the gut of the killifish spontaneously during aging and is also a very good marker 
or inflammation that occurs spontaneously in these organisms. Now, what we are very much interested in my group is understanding the underlying cause for all these transformations that occur during aging. And one of our favorite hypotheses is that there may be some systemic changes occurring in the immune system of the killifish that may be the cause of these transformations across tissues. So uh, killifish, just like us, like I said before, are vertebrates. And vertebrates are characterized by having, um, by being equipped with lymphocytes, which are groups of cells that uh, have the capacity to uh, deploy very uh, smart immune responses against a, uh, a series of different antigens. So in this case, what we are interested in understanding is one particular class of these lymphocytes, the B cells. So what a former uh, phenomenal PhD student in the group, Will Bradshaw, did was to characterize the antibody repertoire in killifish and the architecture of the genomic locus of the region of the genome that is key for the generation of the staggering diversity of antibodies that vertebrates generate throughout life. Why were we interested in this? Well, because the competence of this phenomenon, it's called VDJ recombination that generates this large diversity of antibodies, is something that declines over time, uh, also in humans, and is responsible, for example, for the decline capacity of elderly in uh, mounting a proper um, in a, a immune response, for example, being able to be vaccinated is actually in part caused by a uh, decline in the, in, the, in the functionality of this process. So we were very much interested in understanding whether killifish undergo similar transformation in the B cell compartment during aging. The first thing that we needed to do, though, was to characterize this particular region of the, of the, of the genome. And that's exactly what Will did. I'm not going to go too much into detail, but Will discover and charted this region of the genome, which is composed of two IGH loci that go one against the other. And Will was able to list and catalog the different types of antibodies that at any time can be generated by killifish. And these are IgMs, both secreted in transmembrane, as well as IgDs. So now why we do that? Well, what we want to know is actually how much these antibodies are expressed as a function of the external environment, the type of stimulations that killifish undergo, as well as whether there are changes of antibody se secretion and, and, and synthesis during aging in the killifish, maybe a marker of immunosenescence, aging of the immune system. So this is actually what we all set out to doing. And uh, what these two plots show here is actually a representation of antibody expressed by B cells, by the whole B cell repertoire of a given individual at a given time. Each dot here represents a unique VJ combination, which is an important part component of the, of the antibody of the, of the B cell receptor. And so the area of each dot represents the relative abundance of that particular transcript in the whole antibody repertoire. Therefore, you can have a snapshot that represents faithfully the uh, antibody repertoire displayed by a given individual in a given time by a given sample. Therefore, you can compare the antibody repertoire across samples. And these samples can be the same individual across different time points, different ages, for instance, or could also be uh, could therefore young and old individuals or individuals exposed to different types of environments. So what Will discovered is quite striking. It is that during aging, and the age is indicated by the color of these lines, the pink and the yellow lines, killifish undergo a drastic drop in the diversity of these antibodies. In other words, you find fewer and fewer combinations of unique combinations, novel combinations of these antibodies in the killifish body as the killifish gets older. To say it in other words, older killifish have fewer possibilities to map the environment out there because they have fewer types of antibodies that can take a snapshot of, a snapshot of the world out there. Therefore, probably having a decreased capacity to properly respond immunologically to external stimuli. So to better understand to what extent killifish immune system changes over time, 
a team composed of Eisen, Paul Zadeh, Michael Pushla, and Jens Seidel in the lab took the hematopoietic organ corresponding to the bone marrow in the killifish, which is called kidney marrow, and they actually performed single cell RNA sequencing, a method that allows you to characterize transcripts at individual cell level. And they compared young versus old individuals to understand how immune cells differ during aging spontaneously in a killifish. And what they discovered was quite interesting and that it's the large amount of changes, the, the, most, the vast majority of changes occurring in this organ in killifish have to do with actually innate immune cells rather than adaptive immune cells like lymphocytes that we have shown you so far. But these are actually differences, large scale differences in number of cells that in particular neutrophils that increase in, uh, uh, in relative abundance in this uh, hematopoietic organ with aging. Now, we don't quite yet understand in detail the functional consequences of this so-called myeloid shift. In other words, the increase in myeloid cells in myeloid, myeloid lineage in the killifish with aging, but this is something that we are very much interested in exploring uh, in the, uh, at, at the present time. So, uh, as I've shown you so far, we are very much interested in understanding the basis of the biology of aging in this organism. And why we do this in this organism is that because it allows us to explore biology of aging in a time frame, just a few months, that is compatible with a student, right? With a student's project. In a few months of uh, a student life, you can have your results, right? You can gather enough results and information to, uh, to your experiment. You can, you can answer a question that has to do with perturbations of the biology of aging of this given organism. Just to give you like an example and to put this into frame, if you want to do similar experiments in mice, you have to wait three, four years because mice naturally live so long, right? So it's actually 10 times as long as killifish. If you want to do similar experiments in zebrafish, for instance, you, it, actually you will need even longer because zebrafish are even longer lived than mice. So killifish is a unique, you know, fills a unique niche as a model organism. And this is why my fascination with this organism, which is, because this is the shortest lived vertebrate that can be raised in captivity. Okay, so I showed you so far that killifish aging uh, is actually multi-scale, multi-dimensional. It's actually, I won't be able to tell you all the changes that occur during aging in killifish, also because I don't know them all, but what we know is what I showed you a little bit, plus increased age-dependent risk of death, which is a sort of like operative uh, definition of aging, decreased spontaneous swimming performance with age. As they get older, they, be they become slower, maybe less interested in exploration. They have also a age-dependent decrease in spontaneous learning performance. You can indeed train a fish to learn an association between stimuli and test their learning performance capacity. And as they get older, they become less able to learn. Uh, and this is actually something that we have explored and published in the past. They become less fertile with age, both sexes. They develop spontaneous neoplasias, and this has also been published. And they also have reduced regenerative capacity. So the community studying biology of aging in killifish is expanding rapidly and more and more lab uh, you know, in, in the whole world actually are studying different aspects of biology of aging and other aspects of the biology of these organisms for, for I think what are obvious reasons. So what I would like to do in the next few minutes actually is to entertain a little di uh, you know, diverge, diversion from what I told you so far. And I would like to, to, uh, to lead you through like a um, uh, exploration into the ecology of aging in killifish. And when we think about ecology, we really think about species-species interaction. And uh, I believe that this is really key in understanding deeply biology of aging. Uh, the reason for this is because organisms don't age alone. So we uh, as species and as individuals are indeed a multitude of organisms. So there is the host cells, but there are also microbial cells that are associated with us. And we entertain uh, species species interactions with these other communities of organisms largely microbes that are key to um, our own biology and we need we, we actually our biology uh, depends on them and this is true across the whole 
tree of life, we depend on microbes for the synthesis of vitamins. Uh, plants depend on microbes for nutrient absorption uh, and for defense. Uh, and uh, I, I, I won't have the time to go through all the, the, the clear um, and the obvious associations uh, you know, that range from commensal to symbiotic between microbes and their own host. What I would like to, to discuss though is the importance of microbes during the aging process. And in other words, to, to look in another way to look at the same question, at the same problem is by thinking to how much the microbial host interactions matter to host homeostasis, right? So if we think, if we understand deeply how much microbes do matter for homeostasis, then we can understand that a disbalance between microbes and hosts can actually favor, you know, escape from homeostasis that in many instances leads to, to, uh, to aging processes and disease. Right, resting on this, on this, on this uh, assumption, uh, a former phenomenal postdoc in the lab, Pat Smith, now has his own group at Bayer, close by here in Leverkusen in Germany, he explored the biology of aging in the context of the microbiome in killifish, between adults and old killifish. And so what Pat discovered <clears throat> in this finding actually confirmed what was already known in other organisms, this is work done a few years ago now, is that uh, the gut microbiota of adult killifish consists of several hundred microbial species in captivity. As the killifish get older, get four months old, which corresponds to roughly 81, 82 years for a human being, the diversity of micro, the richness of microbes goes dramatically down. That means that each individual killifish has fewer and fewer types of microbes in their own gut, as opposed to the young ones. And this has nothing to do with older microbes have fewer bacteria in their gut. Actually, the number, the count of bacteria is comparable. What really changes is the, is the number of types of bacteria that become less and less as killifish get older. Now, this drop in diversity and richness, it's not unique to killifish during aging, but it's also associated with aging to, uh, to actually onset of several diseases, for example, metabolic diseases in humans, also, di also diabetes, obesity, um, are associated with drop in microbial diversity with aging. So um, we understand that uh, microbes associated with older killifish have more of a pathogenic known function. So this is a phylogenetic analysis of, killifish, of microbes associated with young, and green, or red, old killifish uh, guts. And so what we can tell from this discriminant analysis is that microbes associated with uh, microbial function associated with old individuals here in red are more um, pathogenic in, um, in function. This is a functional metagenomics. It indicates that the microbes found in prevalent, you know, uh, prominently in older individuals are known to constitute communities associated with disease terms in humans, much more so than the microbial consortia found associated with the young killifish, which have a more, much more of a metabolic, uh, anabolic function. Now, uh, what we actually asked was whether the changes of microbes uh, during killifish life was uh, a um, simply um, an epiphenomenon, a consequence of killifish aging, or whether there was a causal link between microbial communities and aging. So whether, in other words, microbes do participate in the, in the, in the aging process, or they are a phenotype associated with the aging process, but they don't really play a role. So to, uh, to uh, answer this question, what we did was to take young and uh, middle-aged killifish, nine weeks. We extracted their gut microbes. Then we had a new cohort of middle-aged individuals that we treated with antibiotics overnight. So we depleted their gut microbes. And then we transplanted, we transferred the microbes from either young adult donors or the same age donors or another group just treated with antibiotics. And we asked, what is the consequence of this transplant, this transfer of microbes from different age class donors to recipients that are middle age and they are depleted of their own resident gut, gut microbiota. So this was one acute treatment 
repeated multiple times experiment. And what we discovered is that transplanting microbes from young adults to old killifish led to extension of lifespan to the killifish that received the microbiota. Killifish receiving same age group microbes did not live longer than the control killifish that simply uh, did not receive microbiota transfer. However, the killifish that receive antibiotic treatment without transfer lived slightly longer than the control groups. However, not as long as the ones that received the young associated gut microbiota. So this experiment was repeated multiple times and actually indeed was robust, the result. So now we're trying to understand this result a little bit more in depth. And what we found, uh, so of course, first of all, what we did was to understand whether the transfer was effective, whether the microbes that we transfer were indeed acquired and whether they settled in the gut microbiota of the recipient's fish. So we sequenced the microbiota of the recipient fish at different time points. And indeed, we can cluster this microbial community with the donor community rather than with the recipient community before the transfer. So we can uh, validate that the transfer was, was effective. What we uh, observed uh, and we knew already was that killifish locomotor activity declines dramatically with age. So this is a behavioral test to assess the consequences of the transfer at the broader scale at the higher phenotypic level. So killifish, seven, six week old killifish are more active than older killifish. This is speed. One week post transfer across all different groups, there is no real difference among the groups. But a seven weeks post transfer at an age again that corresponds to about 80 years, 82 years in a human being, killifish uh, treated uh, at middle age with young gut microbiota stayed more active remain more active, more so than all the other groups. So this was very interesting because there was indeed an effect at the phenotypic level. What we also were interested in understanding is the uh, transcriptional consequences of this microbiota transplant in the killifish intestine. So we, uh, we ran transcriptomics, so we, we, uh, we characterized the transcriptome of killifish receiving either young, killifish microbiota or same age gut microbiota. And so in general, the, all, the, all the transfer groups at 16 weeks of age cluster with the 16 weeks of age groups, which means that the overall transcriptome doesn't show a rejuvenation of the gut per se. However, interesting terms associated with uh, anti-inflammatory terms and B cell activation were highly, more highly expressed in uh, the killifish receiving young gut microbiota compared to the ones receiving same age gut microbiota. So what I told you so far, uh, and I'm almost uh, uh, done with my presentation is that this gut microbiota does have a tra dramatic uh, uh, consequences on, um, on killifish uh, homeostasis and health. They live longer in captivity. Uh, one other aspect that we're very much interested in understanding is the predictive value of sampling killifish microbiota throughout life. So can we predict, can the composition of microbes per se be used as a, as a biomarker of aging, in other words? So can we understand something about the physiology, the biology of the host by looking at different time points at their gut microbiota? And how did we do that? So this work, this work was done by Miriam Popkes, a PhD student in the lab, a very talented PhD student. So what Miriam did was to sample longitudinally every week stool from killifish. So she went every Tuesday to the fish facility and she collected stool from fish. So she was waiting until they were releasing the stool pellets. And this is, and she did that throughout the whole life of the killifish, which means for, for a few months. So think about doing that in mice, it would take a lot longer. So she did that for several fish, for 53 fish. And then what she did was also to collect water and food samples to monitor also the environmental microbiota. And then she, by using machine learning with the help of Sam Keen, a master student in the lab, we were able to build a model that can predict residual lifetime based on individual trajectories in gut microbiota. And now we can, in a sample, in a, in a set of fish that it's independent from this one, we can predict quite accurately whether a fish is long-lived, short-lived, and how much time is left 
uh, based on their individual microbiota trajectory. So these are not retrodiction, so you cannot simply uh, overfit the model by, by learning it uh, on this same data set, sample set, but you can actually also export it to an independent set and be and have quite accurate prediction of that. So uh, to conclude this part, I would like to say that we are very much interested in understanding the interactions between immune aging, immune senescence, and microbial dynamics. Our favorite hypothesis actually is the following, is that a young immune system actively shapes gut microbiota composition. So it plays an active role in mounting pro-inflammatory responses against pathogens and, sorry, yeah, pro-inflammatory response against pathogens and anti-inflammatory response against commensals. And a aging in this capacity to discriminate between the pro, you know, the pathogen and the commensal leads to expansion of pathogens and suppression of commensals, for instance. So in other words, an immune system is less able to recognize friends and foes will lead to a microbial community that will escape the sort of like immune surveillance, therefore causing damage. However, we are also very well aware, and we actually have proven that, that uh, per se, the microbiota is able to modulate to some extent host uh, immunity. So there is, a mutual, there is a mutual influence of these two branches of, uh, of host biology that we are very much interested in exploring further uh, and uh, predicting host phenotypes from the microbiota, but also we are very much interested in, uh, in um, steering the microbiota composition by playing directly on the immune system. And one way to do that, one, one way to, to control the microbiota community, or at least to test what is the impact of the immune system on the microbiota community is by generating transgenic lines. Killifish is a wonderful model also because it is, um, lends itself to generating many transgenic lines in a very short amount of time. They're short-lived, they have a very short intergeneration time, therefore you can generate adults very quickly and uh, transgenic killifish lines in a very short amount of time. Now, Jens Zydel generated a line of fish that lack completely RAG1. This is a very important gene for the generation of mature lymphocytes. And so he indeed could prove that uh, a population of cells that corresponds to lymphocytes is lost in the RAG1 knockout lines and is currently testing what is the microbiota composition of killifish that uh, have lost uh, adult lymphocytes. Uh, and uh, so maybe next time I will report that to you. Uh, at the moment, we are uh, actually sequencing these libraries and we will know soon whether uh, the uh, microbiota of killifish lacking uh, 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 lymphocytes diverges from that of wild type killifish or whether other branches of the immune system are important for shaping the microbiota. Uh, I guess with that, I probably will go to an end and I would like to uh, go to the uh, acknowledgement slide. Um, and therefore I would like to thank the whole team. Uh, not everybody is uh, represented here, uh, but uh, a lot of people contributed to different aspects of this project. Uh, we have wonderful collaborators that help us on different types of projects. Our funding agencies, the Max Planck Society, EMBO, uh, and uh, I would like to thank you also for your attention and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Oh. I'm going to applaud, <laughs> and I'm sure the audience uh, is also applauding. That was spectacular, Dario. Uh, thank you so much for that. Well, thank you. And um, I, I have a lot of questions. You, you, uh, you had a lot of interesting things in that presentation. Um, so I couldn't help thinking as I was listening to you um, about the whole issue of aging. And I'm wondering whether you would say um, that, that every species has its own aging clock. In other words, um, 
and you mentioned a species that can live for incredibly long time, and of course you're killing fish short. So would you say that in a sense, every species has evolved and that natural selection has led to a clock, which I guess is the balance of the microbiome and the immune system that is appropriate to that environment. Is that how you're thinking about it in terms of uh, evolution? Right. So, uh, I mean, I guess there are also many layers in your questions, right? So, I'll try to <laughs> so um, I guess one point that you're raising is uh, do different species age, if I correctly understand your question, do different species um, in a way share, uh, you know, to what extent different species share aging mechanisms and to what extent um, what it means that different species differ in the way they age? Does it mean that they have uh, different pathways, these molecular pathways that are activated or not? Well, it's a very hard question to answer actually. And, and the reason for that is because we have a big bias in the field, I, I feel, which consists in the fact that um, uh, we have been very much uh, as a field uh, interested in understanding shared molecular pathways and shared physiological mechanism by which different organisms age, right? So, and that just, it is justifiable, I feel, because when you work on a model organism, you want to model aging in humans many times. And so you're very much interested in harnessing the strength of this organism to understand something about the biology of human aging. And therefore, uh, finding out what are the shared aging mechanism is definitely the way to go because it enables you to, you know, identifying drugs and genes to target, et cetera, et cetera, that may be also working in, in humans. As, however, also you raised the very important fact that uh, different organisms largely differ in the way they age, and that is reflected by their uh, you know, the life history evolution, uh, and, 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 and therefore there is large amount of divergence uh, among species. How does evolution comes into play here? I think that oftentimes aging is not necessarily selected per se. Um, uh, there may be selection for sexual maturation or delayed sexual maturation or fast sexual maturation, and oftentimes we understand that clearly in killifish, aging is a consequence of selection becoming less effective in removing the deleterious gene variants later on in life in a, a late reproductive or post-reproductive stage of life. But uh, uh, whether then those, those deleterious genes will affect the same genes across species, I think it's still very early as a field to answer because is it really reason, reason that uh, the field has embraced this sort of like comparative biology uh, approach to, to studying aging across species. And so we are really at the, at the very beginning of this. Um, and, and you are right there at the very beginning of this, I must say. Um, and I, I, I like the idea of um, there being this, this principle of the interaction between the microbiome and the immune system. Um, and I, it seems to me that that principle, although the details of the, the microbiome and the immune system can vary uh, between species, it seems to me that that idea, that interaction could be powerful in looking at aging in different species. And I'm wondering um, if, if you think, again, not necessarily the specifics applying but that same principle could apply to human aging. Right, exactly. So what aspects of, uh, of, of, of microbial aid, um, you know, micro host interactions will matter across species and uh, how would we be go by to, to model this uh, and to even test it in, in, uh, in humans? It's a great question. And indeed, what we are discovering as a field, like you know, the, the microbiome field, although my, my uh, entry port into the microbiome field is from the biology of aging, uh, is that indeed, while in a, the past few years, 
uh, a lot of people were interested in the finding the silver bullet, right? So the, the microbe that was the probiotic, the microbe that, uh, that makes you live longer, that saves you, that cures you. It's become more and more evident that there is no such a thing, right? So that it's really like a community, uh, a very di dynamic community, uh, metabolically active community with a lot of horizontal gene transfer. A community that evolves very rapidly uh, to even, uh, with, you know, uh, overcome uh, uh, antibiotics and uh, drugs and, uh, um, metab you know, host metabolism and host genetic uh, uh, peculiarities, right? So it's a very dynamic and plastic organism. So, okay, go, to go back to how much the models, how much model organisms can help us to to, to understand better whether the microbiome is a useful tool to, to uh, tackle aging or disease in humans. I feel that um, uh, learning, you know, having the, having the scriptures that uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a starting point for us, this idea of the microbial uh, host phenotyping, you know, being able to type host phenotypes, for example, liver disease or brain dysfunction in the microbiota. It's something that, of course, we can do in model organism, but we can honestly do it right away also in humans. So this is at no cost comes, I guess, to doing it right away in, in humans. We could indeed monitor uh, non-invasively uh, um, the inside working of the organism by this wonderful window to the, to the, to the host, which is the microbiota. And it's not just, you know, the genomes, it's also the metabolites in the microbiome, right? So we can use it as the next blood draw, right, in a way, uh, with a lot of, metab of interesting metabolism happening there. Uh, so that's one thing, you know, I think in diagnosis, in um, monitoring, in completing the, 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 the framing of the descriptors of host health, it could be an interesting, uh, uh, an interesting addition and potentially also useful. Uh, now, in terms of intervention, one of the things that we are seeing more and more is this concept of diversity matters, right? Microbial diversity really matters. And per se, maintaining diversity, it's probably very closely related with a healthy, healthy state. So restoring a healthy microbial diversity, it's probably something that per se is useful. We don't quite understand why. Uh, is it a metabolic benefit? Is it actually an immune benefit per se? Because by having high diversity, you keep the pathogens at lower titer. This is something we still don't understand. Um, but I guess, um, I guess in this model, organisms will be key in, I think we have to overcome the, 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 the idea, the illusion to find the perfect microbe for the, the given host. But um, looking more at this uh, other features, diversity or metabolic complexity of the microbiota, maybe something that may turn out to be helpful in humans. For example, uh, I don't want to, but you know, for example, you know, microbiota uh, is, uh, microbiota state uh, is very important also for vaccination. So there is, there seems to be some basal level of uh, activation, you know, innate immune activation of the immune system, which is required for a proper, um, you know, uh, response to vaccination. So if you have individuals treated with antibiotics and then vaccinated, the literature, the scientific literature shows that uh, the odds that the vaccination will be successful are actually lower. So you need some basal, uh, uh, diverse microbiota and rich microbiota in order for the immune system to work properly, even acutely. Yeah, I, uh, I'm fascinated by this and I, I really like the, uh, the idea of looking at uh, the interaction between uh, the gut my, my, uh, microbiota and the immune system. I mean, that, um, and I, I, I can't imagine that we wouldn't find out interesting things if we understood that for, uh, for humans. So I, I have to ask you some questions about you and your science here. Um, how in the world did you come to killifish? What, what is it that brought you to that as the model uh, for what most of your work has been, uh, been addressing? Yeah, 
thank you for asking that. So I actually, I am um, by nature, I'm very interested. I'm, I'm sort of like a naturalist, right? So I, I like, you know, when I walk uh, uh, in, in the parks and I collect stones and leaves and insects and stuff like that. So I've, I've always had like a very strong interest for, for the natural world per se. And I was, uh, you know, uh, I, I became aware of the killifish when uh, um, when I was, you know, before my PhD, because my PhD advisor at the time, you know, who became my PhD advisor, Alessandro Cellerino in Italy at Scuola Normale, told me about this uh, this organism that uh, uh, seemed to be extremely short lived. Probably it was that was is actually uh, its life. Probably it was short lived. It's not simply that hobbyist cannot keep it for longer just than a, a few months. And then, you know, when I entered the, 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 the grad school in Pisa, uh, I, you know, together with him, I drove to, uh, to Parma, to the, to the home of this uh, hobbyist, this collector, Stefano Valdesalici, who was the one in Italy who, who had in his bedroom, was a kid, like he had eggs of this turquoise killifish. So he gave us like, uh, a, a little bucket with this uh, this uh, dirt and eggs of killifish, and so we started raising it during uh, grad school, uh, just as a pet first, uh, and then uh, as we as I was actually seeing that this killifish in this short time uh, was displaying this massive uh, transformations, uh, I got more and more interested in understanding its biology. And, uh, but my PhD project was something else at the time. So it was really serendipitous. It was because of the encounter with, uh, uh, with my PhD advisor, who also is a very curious uh, uh, naturalist uh, and uh, was really, uh, really chance, I would say that I bumped into this fish, but uh, it actually was the model system that drew me into the question of a of biology of aging, because I couldn't quite make sense of it, of why would, on earth, like why on earth an organism would uh, be selected, I thought, to live so short. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a wonderful question. And, you know, isn't it cool that we can look at nature and nature can pose these questions and we can start really going after it and learn things we couldn't have imagined learning, right? I mean, I think that's really, can, is there, you know, um, one thing that you would pull out of what you've discovered with killifish that really surprised you, that you that that caught you, and you, you thought, "Whoa! I never would have imagined um, that that's the way it was." Right. Yeah, there is actually one thing. Indeed, initially, I was, you know, my take on the killifish being short-lived was this must be adaptive. It this must be good for the fish to be short-lived. Uh, this was my initial credo, but. Uh, um, then I discovered that that's not the that's not what happens. So I discover I, I you know I became I became more and more interested in evolutionary biology and uh, comput evolutionary computational genomics, and what uh, together with uh, actually uh, Rong Fang, uh, uh, this this researcher here in the picture, what we uh, what we embarked into studying was the evolutionary genomics of aging in killifish, in particular annual killifish, and what we discovered is that killifish are selected to develop very quickly, to reach sexual maturation very, very rapidly because they live in a unique environment where uh, the water is just available for a few months every year. Most of the year, they survive as dormant embryos in the dry mud in Africa. Actually, we do, as a matter of fact, field work in Zimbabwe, and, uh, and this is how the environment looks like. So most of the year you have cracks in the soil and we have to dig out the killifish embryos from the mud, right? So normally the killifish, so in the, in the rainy season, the killifish are, you know, in these little puddles. But what was surprising to find out is that, right, you know, on one hand, there is a strong selection for killifish to become sexually mature very rapidly. However, let's say they become sexually mature in three weeks time. There are populations of killifish that reach sexual maturity in three weeks time. But within the species turquoise killifish, there are populations that live just three months, others that live eight months, even though they both reach sexual maturity at the same time, right? So there is no trade-off between 
how fast they develop and how fast they age, which is normally like a way of, a way of thinking, okay, you must have, you must, you know, run fast. That's why you, you build up a lot of damage, you know, reactive oxygen species, or you, your, your cell cycle goes out of control. You, you're fast at replicating your cells, but then you have cancer. This sort of like trade-off mentality, but actually killifish go against that in the sense that the shark of killifish are extremely bottlenecked populations that have very small effective population size. I won't get to, into the details, but basically there is a genome-wide accumulation of deleterious gene variants that cumulatively lead to a polygenic aging um, phenomenon. In other words, the reason why we see aging, we understand now in killifish happening at every single level of biological complexity from the DNA level, protein level, different tissues in the brain, in the heart, in the gut, in the skin, in the liver, everywhere. It's because they have accumulated a massive amount of mutational load due to the fact that their effective population size is very small. They are highly drifted. And so selection is very inefficient to remove those deleterious gene variants. Uh, this is a little bit population genetics lingo, so you know, <laughs> you know, directly uh, intuitive, but actually there is a, that there are conditions which is small effective population size, not infinitely large populations, where there is this genomic catastrophe that leads to, to a lot of genomic damage that we understand now cumulatively leads to aging. So in other words, this was to me one of the most exciting finding, initially disappointing because I was hoping to find some sort of positive selection, Darwinian evolution to be fast, but that's not what we found. And to me now, this is one of the most fascinating windows into the biology of aging, both for killifish, but also for humans, because as a species, we also have a very small population size. So I think that what we find in killifish may be relevant also to understand the biology of aging in humans. And I, I bet you would agree with me that you're only scratching the surface of what killifish is going to tell us about aging, right? Absolutely. <laughs> in fact, there is an exploding scientific community that uh, it's, it's reflect this, uh, this, uh, this statement. That's, uh, that's beautiful. And I, I think that's probably where we'll have to wrap this one up. And um, thank you, Dario, uh, for sharing your work. Uh, uh, fantastic. Uh, really enjoyed learning what you've been up to. Thanks for watching Curiosity Meets Discovery, research talks from inside the Max Planck Society. Visit mpfi.org to sign up for updates. Follow us on social media at MPF Neuro. Curiosity Meets Discovery was produced by the Max Planck Florida Institute for Neuroscience.